empresas eléctricas y energéticas de Islandia, Zamorca, eh, con la ponencia titulada Los beneficios económicos y sociales de la calefacción urbana por fuentes geotérmicas. La experiencia de Islandia como un modelo para otros países. Hello everyone. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, here we go. It's an honor to have an, the opportunity to be here at Sunworld. I want to thank you all. It's nice to see how many people are here. So, uh, well, as she said, I come from this small country in the north. It's a tiny little island. Well, not so tiny, it's actually half the size of the UK, but only 350,000 inhabitants. Uh, but it's a magical island. It's the land of fire and ice, mountains and glaciers, where the modern world meets Mother Earth, because it's all powered by nature itself. In Iceland, we produce um, 20 terawatt hours of electricity per year, and that's all renewable energy, only renewable energy sources. We have hydropower, but also the power under our feet, geothermal energy, to produce electricity, and most importantly, for district heating. 90% of all homes in Iceland have geothermal district heating, and 100% of homes in Reykjavik, our capital. Many people my age, they take uh, geothermal district heating for granted uh, and that we produce electricity only from renew renewable energy sources. For our homes to always be warm despite the sometimes harsh winters is thanks to geothermal heating. And I think many of us take it for granted because we grew up with it already in place. But there's nothing really normal about uh, geothermal district heating. It's, it's actually quite unique. And I only found out about this when I joined the energy business about four years ago. And I was immediately fascinated about the story about geothermal district heating and how it came about in Iceland. And today, I want to tell you this fairy tale. And I hope to inspire other fairy tales of geothermal district heating around the world. About 115 years ago, Icelanders were not using any of their local resources for electricity or district heating. We imported coal and oil for our daily needs. In 1904, we had our first energy transition when the first homes were electrified by using a local stream to produce some electricity. But heating the houses was still done with fossil fuels. And this picture shows Reykjavik, um, in the beginning of the 20th century, we call it now an infamous picture because it has all the smoke over our houses. Geothermal water was plentiful, though, and very visible around our capital, but it was only used for uh, bathing, both people and sheep, and then for doing laundry. The main shopping street in Reykjavik bears the name of hot pools, Leiga Vegur. It, it literally means hot pool street. It used to be a popular spot uh, for this domestic task, so that's why uh, it was named after it. But as all other countries, uh, Iceland was caught in the oil crisis in the 1930s. And only then, utilizing geothermal energy for district heating became something to be seriously considered. A couple of decades before, a farmer had used a local stream to heat up his farm. He led some pipes into his house despite warnings from his community priest about using this devil's energy in the earth. The trial was a success with the farmer, but still it was one man's success versus doing it for the whole country. That would be expensive, very, very expensive. And that's why it was very controversial. Iceland was one of the poorest countries in Europe, so it was a huge political debate with some politicians saying district, geothermal district heating was a ludicrous idea. But in the end, the decision was made to do it. The people voted for politicians that approved of this idea to give everyone in Iceland geothermal district heating. The Parliament of Iceland had to introduce a new law uh, to allow the utilization of geothermal energy 
and to launch one of the biggest projects ever to happen in Iceland. This decision took bravery and foresight. It definitely wasn't easy. The massive task nearly bankrupted several communities around the country, and the public had to endure their streets being torn apart for a very long time. Geothermal district heating in Iceland took decades. It began in the 1930s and finished almost half a century later in the 1980s. To explain how much of a, t of a task it really was, you can see here the investment in renewables energy um, utilization as percentage of Iceland's GTP. So when spending was at its highest, it was more than 6% of Iceland's GTP. Our 6% is equivalent to 14 billion US dollars annually. And for comparison, this is the investment uh, in building roads and bridges around the country during the same time. So you can see it really, really was a big investment. So this is the, a picture of energy use in Iceland from 1940. It really tells the story of how we've made the transition from fossil fuels into renewable energy. And geothermal energy is a key factor here. We use our geothermal energy, geothermal energy for many things, but mostly, as I've said before, for district heating. It counts for almost 50% of our energy use. Oil has almost been pushed off the map, and this is basically what is left. Uh, it's transportation, local transportation, so cars. And the funny thing is, you can see that it started actually to increase again a little bit. And that's because recently Iceland has been, become quite popular with tourists. We have had a big tourist boom. And what do tourists do? They hire cars and drive around the country. So, as you've seen, giving everyone district energy uh, heating was no easy task. It was very expensive and time-consuming. So, what's the verdict? Was it the right decision? Well, you tell me. If you compare this picture to the picture I show you, showed you before, the answer is quite clear. No more smoke or no more fog pollution over Reykjavik. So the answer is yes. It was the right decision. But okay, let's talk some numbers. Geothermal district heating has brought huge ec economical benefits to our country. We save 89 billion Icelandic coronas annually by using our own energy sources. Yes, annually. That's 272,000 Icelandic coronas per person in Iceland. And that's about 7,300 soles per person. And the amount is 9% of foreign exchange revenues. So this counts. The environmental benefits have also been great. We are saving the atmosphere some serious CO2. 3.5 million tons every year. That's four times what the Icelandic car fleet emits every year. And to compare, Peru emits 57 million tons of CO2 each year. So Iceland's CO2 savings is equivalent of 7%. And if we have some fun with the numbers, you can see that from the installation of geothermal district heating, we have saved the atmosphere in total of 110 million tons, which is, like I said earlier, about 3.5 million tons every year. And for perspective, this is what we have agreed on uh, in the Paris Agreement to save an extra million ton uh, before the year of 2030. So 3.5 million a year is, is a lot. Using local energy saves Icelandic households a lot of money. This is what the households pay every year for district uh, heating. And as you can see, Icelandic homes pay 65 billion Icelandic kronos less than the average in the OECD. And yet we use a lot of geothermal water. The average family in Iceland uses about 500 tons of hot water every year and 90% of that goes into district heating. But there have been other benefits too. You start with a project with a certain goal in mind. 
uh, less dependency on foreign energy sources, saving precious foreign money, uh, foreign currency. You want cheaper energy for the people, and you achieve those goals. But then something else comes along with it, maybe surprisingly. Because it's all connected. It's benefit for the environment, benefit for the homes, and benefit to the economy. It all means social impact. Using green, local energy has benefited the quality of life in Iceland greatly. Iceland went from being one of the poorest countries in Europe to one of the richest in quality of life. And that's thanks to our resources and sustainable utilization of those resources. You can grow vegetables in our uh, greenhouses all over the country. We can melt the snow in the streets. Uh, so we can enjoy the cold winters instead of freezing because we're sitting in our warm houses. And then there's this, luxury, the things you really cannot put a price on. Our geothermal outdoor swimming pools uh, are a gem, and you'll find at least one of them in every town in Iceland. The water is warm all year round, and it's just glorious to sit in there in the snows especially. There are various health benefits to this. Swimming is one of the best exercise you can get. And our children, they learn early how to swim because of these facilities. And the pools are also a very important part of Icelandic culture. You'll find everyone in their families, my CEO, my prime minister. So if you really want to get to know Icelandic culture, you strike up a conversation in the hot tub. And the Blue Lagoon, which is one of the uh, most known tourist attractions in Iceland, it's runoff water from a nearby geothermal um, uh, power plant. Uh, not only do tourists come to bathe in the hot water, but we also produce other products out of the side streams. For example, beauty and skin products, food supplements even. And here you can see tourists covering their faces in the algae mud that's in the geothermal water that we have. It's good for your skin, and it has proven benefits for psoriasis. One of my favorite facts about the installation of geothermal district heating is that um, reports of severe cold went from 22% of the population in 1937 to only 4% in 1948. And that's thanks to district heating. The downside was basements got too warm to store potatoes. I guess you can't have it all. And then there's this, another favorite fact. Iceland national football team has qualified twice uh, to the big stage of football. 2016 Euro Cup and 2018 uh, World Cup in Russia. This shouldn't even be possible for a nation that is, has only 350,000 people. But do you know what the main, one of the main reasons for this success? It's geothermal district heating because we got heated sports halls. And these guys are the first generation who were able to train indoors in good facilities all year round. So it's one of the key, key parts that we can now enjoy football on the big stage. Even Argentina couldn't beat us at the World Cup. Our goalkeeper saved the penalty from Messi himself. Big moment for us. <laughs> so let's compare a little bit. There are actually a lot of similarities between Iceland and Peru. You may be surprised by this. There are a lot of mountains. Uh, we have glaciers, volcanic activity. And uh, we both rely a lot of hydropower in our energy production. We even have similar names for towns that um, have geothermal uh, activity. Uh, Aquas Calientes, we have almost identical name in Iceland. Kvera Gerde, it's, it's, it's the same. So here is the current um, energy mix in Peru. This is uh, taken from the geothermal country update. And uh, as you can see, hydropower is about 58%. And for comparison, here's Iceland, the blue being hydro, and uh, it's, it's about 80% of our production, and the rest is geothermal, the, the green bit. Wind power is on the rise, but it's still uh, insignificant, so it doesn't show up in this picture. Other similarities, um, this is uh, uh, the potential for geothermal map of Peru and then Iceland for comparison. 
uh, you can see how it, uh, the potential is scattered in, in a, like a little line here, the same in Iceland. It, uh, it's the tectonic plates. And here we have high uh, heat, high temperature, and low temperature scattered all around the country. The only difference between Peru and Iceland, I would say, that Iceland has already taken the steps towards utilizing geothermal energy, whereas Peru has not. And Peru uh, has one of the greatest potentials in, out, of all of the, out of all of the countries in South America for geothermal uh, energy. And now, with uh, the new goals in the world concerning climate change, utilizing this potential really is uh, something that should be done. And you know, Iceland and, P and Peru are really, sometimes uh, you would think they're worlds apart, but then the world is smaller. This is my colleague Sigurjón and his Peruvian wife, Sandra. And uh, they're enjoying a little homemade ceviche in, uh, as a picnic near their home. What a coincidence. I want to end this presentation with a video of Iceland's energy transition so far and our plans for the future. If you're interested in learning more about geothermal energy or, or want to take the first steps, don't hesitate to contact me. Icelanders are specialists in geothermal energy. You'll find me on LinkedIn. Thank you all for having me. It's been a pleasure. Society can change in a short amount of time. Not so long ago, Icelanders were using gas, coal and oil for cooking, lighting and space heating. The first energy transition began in 1904 when the first waterfall was used to produce electricity. Things happened fast after that. Electricity was a household commodity after World War II. The second energy transition began in the 1930s when Icelanders began utilizing geothermal resources for space heating. During the oil crisis in the 70s, the massive project to provide geothermal district heating for every home was taken on. These projects were expensive for a poor country like Iceland was at the time. Today we reap the benefits of the decisions made by the generations before us, and the benefits have been great. Iceland went from being one of the poorest countries in the world to one of the richest in quality of life. We have a story to tell in the fight against climate change. 100% renewable energy sources in electricity production and heating. The black coal smoke over our houses has disappeared. The largest part of Iceland's energy needs does not come from fossil fuels, but from green local sources. Once again, we are faced with a challenge. To succeed, we need the third energy transition. We've done it before, not once, but twice. The energy and utility companies have been in the forefront in both energy transitions so far. And we are committed to be there for the third. Infrastructure for electric cars, better electricity system, full utilization of all resource streams, innovation and development, independence from fossil fuels with green local energy, sustainability and water conservation are part of what we strive for every day. We want the next generation to reap the benefits of the work we put in today. We will continue to be a part of the solution in the fight against climate change. I think my time is up, but it may be... Um, sorry? If there are any questions, please go ahead. Excuse me? Questions? This one? Okay. I'll just hold this.
Buenas tardes. Eh, una, una consulta. Eh, en, en alguna parte leí que en Islandia eh, el servicio de calefacción es gratuito. No sé si eso es correcto, pero si así fuera, ¿cómo hacen para que ese servicio sea sostenible a largo plazo? Porque acá en Perú, por ejemplo, cada vez que se hace una inversión dicen, ok, vamos a cargárselo al usuario, que en la tarifa, o que no sé qué. ¿Cómo es en Islandia el tema, el tema de los costos? De, sobre todo con respecto al, a los usuarios finales. Yes, uh, it's not free. <laughs> you, you pay for it, but we are, we, sorry, we, we do have one of the cheapest in, uh, especially Scandinavia, the Nordic countries, and in Europe. It's cheap, but we still have to pay for it. I mean, that's what, uh, yeah, it would make sense not to. But uh, I want to add one thing. Uh, all of the companies, though, are owned by state or the government. So it's, uh, there are no privately owned digital heating companies. Hola. Y, bueno, y yo quería preguntar, ¿cuántos gigawatts hora producen con geotermia al año en Islandia? Uh, I'm really, I'm, I don't think I have that information right now. I would be able to give that to you uh, at some other point, but I'm really sorry, I don't have that information. <laughs> Massimiliano Calamea, Energroup. Uh, I have just a punctual question about uh, CO2 emission of geothermal energy. Which is the average uh, CO2 emission of a... Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, could you start again? Because my ears had Spanish in them. <laughs> the question is uh, about uh, the average CO2 emission of geothermal energy. Could you please uh, quantify for megawatt, just to have an idea, for megawatt hour, of course. Um, I'm not sure what the percentage is per megawatt hour, but obviously it does have some uh, emission. It's still the, the lowest of what you can find. All energy utilization has some effect on nature, it, everything has some emissions, but it's still quite low. Okay, thanks. Something around 400 uh, grams for kilowatt hour? Uh, the, uh, it could make sense, yes, something like that. Thanks. Hello. Hello. Just a question. If Finland was such a poor country at the time, how did they manage to get the finance to finance this, this large-scale countrywide project? Uh, well, it was uh, just the state decided to do it. There, there was there were no um, there, there was no fi finance coming in from uh, foreign countries or anything else. So it was just a state um, decision to do it. So it was a huge thing. That all? Gracias. <laughs>